This is the life. <laughs> you can hear Dave in the background chuckling away. Good morning, Ed here from Crystal Clear Aquatics, and I'm lapping up the relative luxury, something we're not used to having on uh, many of these jobs. At least we've got somewhere to bolt to if it does rain. But today starts the beginning of another construction job. Um, this is probably going to be one of the larger ones for this season. We've just spent a few days last week relining uh, a very small pond over in the Guildford area of Surrey. Uh, a bit of a warm up for us to start this bigger job. Um, we'll be on site for this one for uh, you know a good six weeks or so, I reckon. So this is the pond that we shall be working on. Lovely, lovely setting, lovely backdrop. And it's going to be nice to work with a very formal shape for a change. So the idea with this job, as always, is to try and ultimately conceal the visible pond lining around the edges. And as you'll probably be aware, if you've watched any of my other videos, to successfully do this, we need to achieve a nice uniform level shelf all the way around the pond, which is submersed onto which we can start to build up stonework. And on this pond, there is already a nice level edge, but it needs to be dropped down lower than water level. Lots of fish in the pond, we've got lots of koi, and we've also got something which I see very, very infrequently now, but we've got lots and lots of sticklebacks. I'm expecting these to be the three-spined stickleback, but there are shoals and shoals of them. Apparently, many years ago when this pond was first put in, uh, the original owner of this property had gone round and hooked out a few fish from the local stream, which is either going to be minnows, sticklebacks, or miller's thumbs, bullheads, and in this case, it's the stickleback. They've bred, they've done very well, and there are tons and tons and tons of them in here. So that's going to be quite a challenge to hook all of those very small fish out alongside the bigger koi, but we will do our best to make sure we do so. Another challenge on this job is that the garden is on a bit of a slope, so there's not really anywhere particularly flat and level to set up holding tanks and stock tanks. So we've chosen about the most level point of the garden to put the livestock holding tank, our frame tent, our tent, our frame pool. Um, yeah, we're not camping. Last outing for this was the, uh, the hotel job last year, which if you haven't watched, I'll put a description in the, in the link below, but that was a big pond. Um, thankfully, the, the holding tank seems to be in good shape, so it should stand well for, for this job as well. Target today is to get the pond fully emptied, all the fish out into the holding tank, and just to kind of establish our base and get all our equipment and bits and pieces out. Now, the weather today and for the rest of the week really is looking a little bit depressing, um, a bit wet, April showers, but instead we're in May. Um, not ideal for digging and groundwork, but if we can leave the pond liner in place and just fold it back in sections, get the gazebo up so that we can dig at least in the dry, um, we'll sort of make minimal mess and hopefully the soil can stay as, as dry as it needs to be for digging. Um, Alongside the, the stonework and the edging, this job is going to be incorporating a raised wall over this end of the pond, again with a nice formal water blade and some uplighting. I think that's going to work very well in this job. And we've got a nice screened off area over here behind the fencing where the filtration can go. This lovely, lovely covered seating area here beside the pond, which is a really nice spot to sit of an evening and enjoy the pond. It's going to be integrated into the pond area. So this lovely Indian sandstone paved surface is going to be extended to come out and join up with the pond edge, which will also be an Indian sandstone paved edge. So that's just going to help to tie in much better this paved area with the rest of the pond and just to finish it off and make it look a little bit more complete. But before we do anything too messy, I'm going to finish off my morning coffee. So that's the fish holding tank put up and filling. And now we're setting up a separate tank to hold on to a lot of the original pond water. There's a lot of goodness in that pond water. It's already established and mature. And we want to try and keep hold of as much of that as possible for the duration of the job. So when we have finished, we can put in established water back into the pond so that the water parameters, the water quality isn't too different from when the fish came out originally. These little pop-up tanks are fantastic. A nice portable, flexible tank. 
and the whole thing is held up with these sort of noodle floats. The tank fills and these floats, it brings that collar up and it creates a nice sort of stable vessel which will hold the water. Um, again, this ideally wants to be set up on as sort of level a surface as possible. There's a bit of a slope, so we're not gonna be able to get it filled right to the top, but we'll be able to hang on to a substantial amount of water. When these are full, this is three and a half thousand gallons, so we'll probably be able to salvage a good 2,000 gallons in here. So here we go. Bond water almost out, down to the slurry and the muck from the bottom. And this is the time to start hooking out the fish. You'll probably see all the little ripples and the water dancing around here. That is masses and masses of sticklebacks. A bit more of a challenge than the usual goldfish or koi to hook out. But nice to see, because it's not something I'd see very often at all in a pond. You all right in there, Dave? We've got some helpers today. This is a good time to introduce my clients for the job. We've got Natalie and Mark chipping in. Hello. And this is where they're going to. So we've got a mixture here of a few koi, some goldfish. Apparently there's a few green tench in the bottom of the pond, which I look forward to finding. And then lots and lots of sticklebacks. And we've been able to retain a large portion of the original pond water. Weather's looking threatening. We've not had any rain yet. Let's see if I can get in the pond without falling. So the pond, as you can see, is mostly drained, but we've now got the painstaking task of trying to hook out as many of these little sticklebacks as possible. And this is what we're looking for. Look at the ripples on the surface, and there's a few tadpoles. Let's see if I can spot a a stickle back. There we go. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on the camera. If I get right down there, somewhere in there you might see a little head of a stickle back. If you get him in your hands, let me have a look. Perfect. So these are the little critters. So this is our native three-spined stickleback. Lovely little fish, don't see it very often in ponds. As all of our native nature seems to be, it's massively in decline, but it's nice to see that they're doing so well in this pond. They've got very interesting breeding habits, the stickleback, with the males building a, a little nest. That's an unhappy one there. And they develop a lovely, lovely red. I can see, oh, what have we got here? Bright red fins on that. Look, try and get a scoop there, back. Hey, missed it. Something there with bright red fins, possibly a minnow rather than a rud. There it is again. Bit bigger, hang on, let's see what comes to the surface. And there's another one there as well. That's a rud. There we go. It's like a lucky dip. Absolutely no idea what's in here. Pop them in there. Thank you. Yeah, you never get bored of doing this sort of thing because you've got no idea what you're going to find. Oh, so we've hooked out the majority of the, the obvious fish. I'm sure there are a few bits and pieces left in here. And as we're hooking out the mud, if we see any, they go into a bucket of water. There's lots of smooth newts in here. Um, dragonfly larvae, which again we're trying to hook out as much as we can, but thankfully all of this slurry and silt is actually going down to another pond at the bottom of the garden and the whole lot's just being tipped in. So anything left that we haven't found should find its way quite happily down at the bottom of the garden. There's a lot of muck in here. So very conveniently, down at the bottom of the garden, down at the bottom of we've got the a more wild pond. Now at some point in the future, there are potential ideas and plans to do something with this. Um, but for the time being, most of the spoil and the debris that's dug out from that pond is gonna come around here, just to reduce the overall area of this, because it's far too large. And thankfully, it's nice and close to the other pond, so not too far to trudge all of this.
Day two of the job. A lot of rain last night. The pond's got a lot of water in, which I'll have to drain out. But first thing this morning, what I want to do now that we've got everything emptied, is to start to establish some levels. So I can start to get an idea in my mind of exactly what the levels are like all the way around the pond. Now, thankfully, this pond originally had been put in pretty level. There's a concrete pad all around the outside of the pond, um, which has been done pretty well. So I know that the, the pond itself is quite level all the way around. But what will be the finished height is going to be dictated by the paving in this lovely seating area, because this is going to be coming out to meet the pond edge. And obviously, I want to keep this height all the way around the pond. So I'm just going around with my laser so I can get an idea of what these levels are like and how that's going to tie in and the relationship it's going to have with the lawn and the slope at the other side of the pond. I've got my laser set up on a tripod and very simply, just using a level here, I'm going to make a mark giving me a reference point of the laser beam in relationship to the level on the height of this paving. There is a slight fall and that fall will continue down to the pond. So I'm going to lose about 10 to 15 mil from that line. But for the time being, I'm just keeping that line as a reference. And I'm now going to go around the pond, offering this level up at various different points against the laser to see whereabouts the height of this level is. Now on a sort of a, a dark day, an overcast day, probably from about 30 or 40 feet away, I'd still be able to see that red laser beam. It's nice and clear at the moment on my level. But this morning it's quite bright and by the time I get to the other side of the pond, it's unlikely I'm going to see this. So to enable me to be able to, to read that laser level, I've also got a little receiver, which when it meets the, the laser beam will beep, giving me indications as to whether or not I'm higher or lower than that laser beam. It's very useful, it's great for jobs like this. So over here, finished surface height of the pond is going to be bang on lawn level towards the back. Now obviously the lawn slopes up slightly, although not a tremendous amount around the pond. So that height is perfect and that's going to work really well. Let me just compare that over here. Yep, that's perfect. So again, finished height is nigh on, bang on lawn level over here. It's like it was meant to be. Yeah, that's perfect. That's going to work well. So the next job is going to be waders on. Get this liner cut, pull it back, start draining away the water that's pulled underneath it, and then I can start digging. But before I do that, I'm going to finish my morning coffee. So with all the water taken out from the top of the liner, you can now see what's underneath the pond liner. And this is, it's not too much of a cause for concern, but it's not ideal. Obviously, I'm going to have to pump this away and I don't want to get the ground to remain too wet from uh, an excavation and digging point of view. It's just going to make it hard and messy. Um, obviously, we're at a lower spot of the garden here, but we're not at the lowest point down at the bottom pond over there is the lowest point. So I haven't got any concerns about hydrostatic pressure here lifting the liner. Um, but we've had a very wet winter, a very wet March, a bit of rain recently, and there's obviously a certain amount of groundwater which is migrating this way now that the pond has been emptied. It's allowed everything to start to sort of migrate into this, into this pit. So we've got to cut the liner and then hoover out all of the water underneath. Oh, look at all of that. Now I want to keep this pond liner in the pond for as long as possible so that as I'm digging, depending on the weather, I can then fold the liner back down again to protect what I have dug and to try and keep the ground relatively dry. And there we go, there's a lot of water in here. So now I've got to get all this drained out. So I'm just at the beginning of the technical stage of this, starting to establish the levels for the shelving around the pond. Um, the design of this pond is it's going to have a shallow marginal zone all the way around the perimeter of the pond. Um, 
few inches of water above the retaining wall so we're not breaking the surface of the pond and making it look smaller, but making sure that the water depth on this marginal zone is shallow enough that the fish aren't going to get over into the shallow areas and cause a problem with the plants. Uh, now to be able to create this retainer, I'm digging out a small level kind of shelf or platform which will become the foundation for some solid density concrete blocks. And once I've laid those onto that, I'll start to build up the retainer of natural stone. I'm using some, excuse me, got a bit of plant in my mouth. I'm using some bricks here just as a, as a kind of a reference for me so I can get a visual guide as to how high this retainer is going to be. And using an overflow, which is in existence, I've taken a, an approximate level of what will be water level. So between the reference of the water level and the height of what will be the retaining wall, I'm just working out how deep that water will be. So here we've got about four inches of water so that's perfect now obviously i have to allow a little bit of muck underneath all of these stones and underneath the block that's going to raise it slightly but i can raise the water level a little bit to counteract that by putting a joint on articulating it and lifting it at the back here i'm also digging out a little bit of the, the soil it's pointless having the same depth all the way along because i'll end up with far far too much gravel for the planting area so i'm just digging this back section down a little bit higher than this section down here so that I've got about six inches of gravel in this planting zone. That's plenty for the plants to root into um, and I shall be as liberal and as wasteless, if that's the word, as possible. So as long as the weather holds out, I'll crack on digging. So I think this is going to be the daily routine. Arrive at site and have to empty the pond of all the water that it's filling up with. This is a very wet garden. The trials and tribulations of pond building. Honestly. So this morning, that seems to be the case, the daily routine is to empty out the pond yet again of more water. The pump has decided to pack up. It's been a good pump on me, that one. I've got spares, but that one's my favourite, so I'm going to have to replace that. Which means we're going to have to use the vacuum to empty out the pond, and that's going to take ages. But the reason why the pond keeps filling up with water is that in yesterday's digging, We discovered, oh, I can't see it under there. You can see it this side. A four inch clay pipe. This is an old fashioned sort of um, soak away or groundwater pipe. It's connected in various sections loosely with gaps in between that allows the groundwater to enter the pipe and then discharge off elsewhere. Well, of course, at some stage in the history of this pond, but it was dug, that's been intercepted and it looked like it had been hurriedly filled back in again with loose material and clay over here. I suspect the pipe has probably been disconnected or removed entirely, either at one end of the pond or further down behind the hydrangeas there at the next pond, because there's nothing that pops out at that sort of level. So in the meantime, there's a lot of water that's migrating down the garden, and of course, it's been intercepted by the excavation of this pond. So it's been a busy morning, a complicated affair of trying to square this up and make sure that it's square to the paving that's inside the shelter beside the pond because it's that which is really going to dictate the shape of this pond as that paving is going to come right up to the edge of the pond. Everything from there has to be uniform and square. Can't be off kilter, it'll look really daft. Ideally, it probably should have been done the other way around. Probably the pond should have been put in first and then that paving done afterwards. But thankfully, that's been done um, relatively square to this. It's not too much of an adjustment to make. So we've been laying out lots of high-vis strings so that we can get this square. And how many times am I going to say the word square in this video? I don't know, but quite a lot. And uh, after a lot of head scratching and jiggery pokery, we've got basically an outline which is the essential footprint of this pond, so there's not going to be too much extra digging or, or cutting, and which is then square to the paving in there. To make sure this was absolutely square, that's about 10 times I think, uh, we're now measuring the diagonals, which is the all important thing. As long as your diagonals are the same, then you know that the shape you've got is true and square. 11. <laughs> <laughs> so, my uh, Wonderful assistant David is going to hold the measure to the inside corner. David. Hold it nice and taut. Inside corner, 8 metres 32, 8 metres 33. Let's go to the next diagonal. 
And for heaven's sake, don't trip up on the strings. No, I shan't touch them. See, once these strings are down, we can't move them. Only by your feet. Yeah. So 8.32, 8.33 is the magic number. 8.32 and three quarters, 8.33. Absolutely bang on. Hurrah. There we go, aren't we clever? So if this sounds complicated, it's because it is. But it's done. We've used, um, I mean, you, to, to be able to get this square, you can use a, a proper builder's protractor, a builder's square, which gives you a, a correct right angle. Um, I've used some concrete blocks and when we first started our main string and I took a line off of the slabs and the pointing from inside the shelter and made sure that that was perpendicular to those slabs, I then used concrete blocks to be able to get that proper 90 degree corner so I could then continue with my strings. So that's worked out well. Next thing for us is to work out how much of the old concrete footing that was there needs to be cut away. As you can see, if you look down the line at the concrete beneath, as we move to the back of the pond, there's going to be a lot more overhanging into the pond than there is at this end. And so you may see some little red dots that I've spray painted in places. That gives me an idea of how much I'm going to have to cut away to be able to then create that proper square, that's 12, shape. So this back wall needs a lot of adjusting. This one, a minor amount. There's about three inches difference from one side to the other. This one is almost square. So we'll be cutting a uniform amount off of that one. So this was our initial string. This is what I've taken as a reference. And this is the, the edge of the slab and the pointing joint here. That's the first string that's gone down and from that everything has, from a 90 degree corner, been able to be worked out to create that square shape. So the next task is going to be to mark up a little bit more visibly with some red marker paint what's going to have to be cut away with the disc cutter. And the reason why I'm having to do some cutting is that when the pond liner is fitted into the pond and then stonework is built, I don't want to make the pond smaller by having to build stonework up in here, but equally as the pond liner comes over, we don't want to see this visible strip of lining here. So to be able to retain the original footprint and keep it the same size, I'm now going to chop about a brick's thickness, about four inches, 10 centimetres of this concrete pad so that we can dig out another small rock shelf which is going to go down about the height of a brick so that once the pond liner has gone in we can build up some internal stonework that will finish at the final correct paving height so that the paving slabs at the end can come up right up over the top of those stones overhanging ever so slightly and that will create a nice visual of stonework capped off with the Indian sandstone. Well, whilst I've been busy chopping away the inner ring of concrete to square up the pond, Dave has been occupied building what appears to be a man trap. Bloody great big second hole, even bigger than the first hole, intercepting that four inch soak away pipe. There it is in the pond. That's the first hole, but that's too close to the pond and the ground is very sandy here. It's started to cave away. So another hole over here, so we can get this hole filled in. So the plan is we're gonna block off the lower section of pipe that runs from this hole down to the pond using a little rubber four inch bun. We've removed one of the sections of pipe, these are just loose, so they're just laid in the ground like this, butted up to the next layer. And water percolates down through the gaps on each joint of pipe, enters the pipe and discharges off elsewhere. It's an old version of today's modern version, which is the, the large sort of plastic perforated pipe. 
So this does a very similar sort of thing. So we've been able to just lift up and remove a piece. We'll bung it up this side. All the water is going to run down into this pit. We'll dig this out a little bit deeper and we'll drop in a sump pump in there so that as this chamber fills, the pump will automatically drain the water away so that at least for the duration of the job, we haven't got any issues of water soaking away down there. Right. Suitably bunged. And like the giant suction hoover from a dentist, Dave has been sucking away all that water. Now we've got to dig this out a little bit deeper than the pipe. I can't always be lucky, and this is slowly becoming the pond from hell. Well, no, it's not been that bad, but there's been a lot of pipe work and drainage that we hadn't expected and neither had my clients expected that we've unearthed in the process of digging out this pond. And it's been causing a lot of headaches and a bit of a nightmare with water. Once the pond is done and filled with water, it's not going to be an issue. But from the construction point of view, it makes that side of things quite difficult. So we're having to deal with the water on a daily basis. Um, we had initially dug a little sump or an inspection hole just down beside the pond over here. And we'll be using that to drain away the water before it got to the pond. Unfortunately, that was a little bit too close to the pond and the soil here, the structure of the soil is very sandy. That was starting to cave in a little bit. So that had to be hastily filled in and another larger, deeper pit dug a little bit further away from the pond. And we've since installed a automatic sump pump with a very clever little magnetic float that turns itself on and off and the water level fills up. That was installed yesterday and that was running really well throughout the entire day. It kept the pond dry. However, we came up this morning to find that much water in the pond and that's because I forgot to turn the pump on. Hmm, great. All of the surrounding concrete had been cut. And then from that, having had that square shape, we were able to then sort of fine tune and adjust the shelving all around the sides. So that's been kept nice and square to the pond. The internal deeper section, I mean, I'd like to have gone slightly bigger with this deeper section, but we've got pipe work running along here and then all the way underneath to that sump over there. And then as we were digging the deeper section, we discovered a second pipe that connects to it. Now, thankfully, that second pipe actually wasn't joined to anything. And I think that had been laid down in the bottom of the pond to act as a safety barrier to allow the groundwater that collects beneath the pond liner to discharge. So that's a good thing to do, and that'll obviously go back into the pond. We'll probably have to end up making this bit a little bit deeper. And then we can start to tidy up the excavation, tidy up around the edges and get measured up for the pond liner. So we've taken the executive decision to actually remove this length of clay pipe in the pond so we can move the whole lot of the drainage back a little bit. And that means that we can then extend this deeper section of the pond. Although this is deep enough, I feel that in the overall kind of footprint and the surface area of the pond, this deeper section is not big enough and it needs to be extended a bit more. This old clay pipe we're going to get rid of completely and we'll replace it with the more modern plastic perforated pipe which has been used down here. And this is useful because the old method of laying this ground drainage pipe are these very short sections of, of clay pipe that just butt up to each other. And the idea is that the little gaps between each section of clay pipe allow any groundwater that's nearby to migrate into the pipe where it can then flow off supposedly and drain somewhere else but over the years debris has got down into those cracks and, and filled it up particularly here as it's a very very sandy sort of substrate so a lot of the pipe is then filled up with a layer of sediment but also there's a big willow tree close by willows have got enormously invasive root structures and you can see that the clay pipe is just filled completely bunged with a long sausage of roots so this particular drainage has not been particularly effective and whilst we've exposed it we might as well replace it Ugh. nice look at that though that's amazing i mean that willow was getting a nice drink from this but that's not what we need
look at that. So in terms of pond building, this is really not what you want to encounter. This is pretty much worst case scenario, really hadn't expected any of this. So there's an awful lot of work, unplanned, to get all this into a position where we can start to build. But we've discovered it, it's got to be dealt with. So worst case scenario has just got worse. So, uh, yesterday, talking about um, rerouting the pipework that was in the pond so that we could get a larger area of the pond dug out for a deeper section and then reconnecting it up onto the original connection over there where we removed the clay pipe work, um, which was completely stuffed full of roots. We've been able to get a nice part of the pond dug out here and this is much more in proportion and a nice big area for future koi in this pond to, uh, to have a bit of extra space and more importantly pond volume. But the issue we encountered was all of that pipe work that was blocked with roots, the roots just get thicker and thicker and thicker as it comes this way and a piece of original pipe that disappears off summer, we don't know yet where it discharged to, was entirely blocked. Um, so it's absolutely pointless replacing this pipe work and trying to plumb it into another piece that's blocked up. So we've come to the executive decision to do even more work and to reroute entirely water from one side of the pond and plumb it in so that we can discharge it off directly down to the bottom of the garden near that pond. Uh, rather than using a section of perforated pipe in the trench over here, which runs the risk in the future of roots from this willow, exploratory roots getting in and blocking it up, even if it's wrapped up in fleece, there's still overlap sections and these roots can work their way in. We'll instead trench down and we'll put a rigid length of pipe and have that discharging off down into the bottom pond, um, open-ended so it can be maintained and that will take care of that water. Um, we'll probably end up running some perforated pipe up this end as well just to act as an additional catchment so that we can then discharge all of that water away. It's a lot of trenching to do um, but it really is the best thing to do. We could rely permanently on a sump and a pump and that will work but of course we're relying then on a piece of electrical equipment which at some stage could fail. So much better to rely on gravity which is always going to work and as long as that pipe is put in correctly and at the right depth and at a gradual gradient um, then it's almost foolproof. Today we just need to carry on tidying up, scraping, getting the levels right around here. We're expecting a delivery from Lindsay Clarks, good old Lindsay Clarks, for some of our building materials. Uh, and then it will be the laborious task of trying to start wheelbarrowing tons and tons of sand and aggregates and cement and bits and pieces down loads of steps to the bottom of the garden here so we've got everything to hand. Weather's on our side thankfully which is great. Uh, not all that else has been though, but we're making progress. So finally, we're at the time for the all-important measure. Always an exciting prospect on jobs like this because it knows that you're making progress. Again, I'm not going to get into too much of the detail for doing this. It's pretty simple and straightforward. And if you've seen any of my other videos, I always end up saying the same thing over and over again. So I am simply laying a flexible measure. You could do it with a piece of string and measure it afterwards, but I've got a nice long flexible tape. And we're just going to lay this along the length of the excavation, the width of the excavation, following all the contours so we can get a measurement. And then I'm making sure that I have a bit of an overlap all the way around just to make sure that the liner is big enough. So we've got our guesses and for a change, both of us have guessed the same length. So I reckon on 10 meters by eight. 10 by eight and a half, thereabouts. And you're saying about the same, aren't you, Dave? I am. Enough of an overlap, 27 feet. So what's that in meters? Oh, it's less. Mm. We were both wrong. Eight meters, 30, eight meters, 40, okay. And as always, measure twice, cut once. We'll just do that again. Eight metres, we'll say 8.3. And as I have a memory like a sieve, I'm going to make a note of this measurement now. And we will repeat the same for the width. And then we'll have a look and see what the measurement for the liner is. And whilst measuring, I've just heard some noises that sounds like a delivery driver. 
and I can see Shane from Lindsay Clark's. Here he is. All right, he's not camera shy. <laughs> I'm always a bit of a warrior, as my mum would say. And I have to say, I always hate this bit. We've got a few overhead cables that we have to look out for. Luckily, no cars to carry the, uh, the materials over. And then it's going to be a long job of shifting all this down the steps and back into the garden. Right, back to the pond line and now that we've had our delivery. So, we've had our measurements and we've got a measurement of 8.3 by 7.3. That's unlikely we're going to get that exact measurement. It's probably going to be something like an 8.3 by 8 or 8.5 by 8 or possibly 9 by 7.3. But I'll make a call. I'll be using Gordon Lowe, um, fantastic supplier in the UK who manufacture and um, stock lots of different types of liner. I'll be using the one mil heavier duty rubber liner, either a green seal or a firestone rubber, depending on what's available. Uh, and obviously a heavy duty gauge pond fleece as well. Uh, now 8.3 by 7.3, let me just get my calculator up, 8.3 by 7.3, so that's 60, just over 60 square meters uh, of area, so 60 square meters of fleece. Generally pond fleece arrives in two meter widths, so we would be talking about a 30 meter strip of two meter wide fleece or thereabouts. Um, it's always best to overdo the fleece. So if in doubt, get a bit more. I'll be using the old fleece from this job plus the old bits of carpet and bits and pieces. So one layer of new additional fleece is gonna be sufficient. So let's get my credit card out and make a phone call. All right, Friday morning, hurrah. Dan, if you're watching, it would be Peroni Friday. Not to be, I'm being healthy. Feeling a bit knackered, I have to say, from yesterday. Dave, you a bit achy? Just a tiny bit. Yeah, a bit of aches from bringing down all of the uh, materials yesterday. But we've got some stuff here now we can actually start building. So we've got one more tonne of ballast. Very generous tonne, I have to say. Um, which is going to get wheeled down here. And I'm going to start to lay some blocks inside the pond so that we can start to form that internal structure. Dave's doing the usual morning routine of unearthing the pond. Hey? The heavy work. The heavy work, yeah. Dave's the heavy hitter. And thankfully, we're keeping much of the water under control and managed. Little puddle forming in the bottom, but I mean, that's to be expected. It's a pretty deep hole. But the groundwater that was running off into the pond, we're dealing with, so. That's good news. So hopefully, by the end of today, it's gonna to start taking shape. Pond line is ordered, uh, Gordon Lowe, great service, and it's gonna be arriving next week, um, Wednesday, by all accounts, so that's fantastic. So that gives us a few days to get all the internal block work done, finishing touches to the interior pond, and then we can probably start thinking about some of the um, drainage before the liner arrives. And then once that line is in, and the water's in the pond, it will be go, go, go. So all the block work was successfully laid on Friday. It's now Monday, it's had the weekend to go off. Uh, there's a bit of a gap behind the blocks here that we've got to fill, which I'll be doing now. Um, and apart from a few sort of final little scrapes here and there and some tamps and a bit of root removal, that's the excavation done, ready to line. Lining is due on Wednesday. I'm not expecting to get time to put it in on Wednesday, so let's say sort of Thursday onwards. So by the end of this week, there should be some water back in this and we can start to make it and it'll be a pond. Feeling a little bit achy and sore, a little bit tired after my weekend of partying. Um, but it's nice to get back and uh, start making progress. And thankfully the weather gods have been looking down upon us and the next week or two looks really, really good, set fair. If anything, it's gonna be a little bit too hot, but I'm not gonna grumble. Dave's busy at the moment bringing down that, that last ton of ballast that's at the front of the garden. So I'll get my waders on and crack on. So I've just dug out a small foundation here for what will be the feature wall, the water blade wall. Obviously there's the original concrete um, kind of collar that's running around the pond. It's not massively thick and I've extended this a little bit and gone a little bit deeper just to add some additional strength and sort of integrity to this section. Now the 
walling itself, which will be kind of on tiers. It's not going to be any particular height. Um, and this is really overkill, but I'd always rather over engineer something. Got the big willow behind here. Those roots could cause some movement later on down the line. So having a better foundation is only going to improve things. And I'll probably lay a few lengths of uh, metal rebar in there as well, just to reinforce that concrete a little bit. Dave's on the mixer, doing the ballast for me. In fact, he's on form, he's already poured a couple of buckets in. So we'll get this poured and then we'll finish up filling up the gaps here behind the concrete blocks. And then I think it will be, we'll start digging the trenching for the drainage and the plumbing, which I'm not looking forward to. So the foundation has gone off nicely for the wall in. Walking across that now. And the digging has begun, so we can start to reroute the drainage. This is the bit I've not been looking forward to. So yesterday we spent a couple of hours starting the trenching, trying to keep the trench as neat and small as possible. So we're removing as little soil as possible, and so it can all go back together quickly. As you can see already, some of this is filling up with water. And the danger is that because it's such sandy substrate, such sandy soil here, that as this starts to fill up with water and the sand gets saturated, it's going to start collapsing in on itself. So time is of the essence. We need to really get this dug out and all the pipework laid as quickly as possible. So I think here we are almost at the correct depth. We're going to leave this little plug of soil here to prevent all that water from continuing to fill the rest of our trench. And then we've got to carry on all the way. Keep coming. All the way down here. And then get underneath a little wall to terminate our pipe. So again, another day of just lots and lots of digging. It's been all right up until this very last section and the ground here is soft, it's caving in, there's no room to dig, my hands hurt and I'm bored of digging. Oh, nearly there. another day on the job and I think Dave and I are both feeling a little bit jaded after our recent activities. We've pretty much finished digging the trench, we've got about another 10 feet to go and uh, we'll be in a position where we can start to link it up to the old pipe and then we can do away with our old sump and pump and then get back onto building the pond. The trench is no mean feat. I don't know if you get an impression of the, the depth here but that's a little over 90 centimetres deep, it's so almost a metre, and runs for about 50 feet, nice and neatly. Look how much water is in this bit though. So we've just got that final little bit here to bridge so we can join up to the pipe work and then we'll also dig a little trench along the back of the pond here so we can install some perforated pipe so we can draw all the water away from the pond and get that discharged and evacuated out into the bottom pond. Yesterday we had a, a brief distraction from digging by going to uh, Oasis to go and collect all of the stock for the pond. So pretty much all the equipment is now um, here to hand. I've got the UVC, the pumps, various lighting kits, pipe work, fittings. Uh, we're still missing the filtration system, um, the stainless steel water blade, but that's going to be arriving soon. So pretty much everything is here and ready. Pond liner arrived yesterday. Thank you, Gordon Lowe, for your fantastic service as always. So once we've got this pipe work finished, the plan is tomorrow to get the pond liner in, get the pond filled up with some water, and then you can have the bank holiday weekend, hurrah bank holiday weekend, to settle before building next week. And I'm looking forward to a three day weekend, I have to say. <sighs> tools for jobs like this. Well, some really useful tools for digging trenches. This is fantastic. This is a very long handled spade called a graft or a graft designed for digging post holes. Brilliant for this. 
Also got those kind of scissor style um, post hole diggers or soil removal tool, that's fantastic. A nice heavy duty chisel or digging bar, invaluable. A laser, absolutely essential. I wouldn't be able to do this without the laser so that I can monitor the gradient from the fall from the pipe at the top end here and make sure we've got that natural slope so that we can use gravity to remove the water rather than a pump. And probably the most important thing is grit and determination. Grr. I'll add to that a good back as well. Still digging. So just a final section of pipe work to connect. And then we'll be joining up onto the live end, the end where the water's coming out of. That's the culprit. And then we can turn that pump off. So look at that. I mean, this is dry. We've not had any rain, any substantial rain for a long time. And this is still permanently weeping. So there's a lot of water. You know, I dread to think how much would be coming out of that if we've had a very wet period. So once that's joined on, we can switch the pump off. So, to be able to successfully join our newer 110 mil four inch plastic soil pipe to the old fashioned clay leaky pipe or perforated pipe, I've simply cut a short section off of the four inch plastic pipe and then with a disc cutter just cut down through the centre of it so I create this sort of opening and then I can use this as a sleeve and insert it one end in the pipe and the other end the four inch will slot over with a bit of a jiggle, there you go and butt right up to it. Now it doesn't matter that there's little gaps because of course all these sections of clay pipe have just been butted up next to each other. There's gaps between every, every section. But that's going to draw the bulk of the water away from the clay pipe into our pipe and hallelujah, we've got rid of it all. So we've narrowly avoided a major landslide and we have connected up the pipe work. So we're going to get this bit backfilled only a little bit just to secure it all and shore it up and then we can start fleecing and graveling before the next perforated pipe goes in over the top. Like that. Thank you. Today is the day. The pond liner is here on site and the intention is we're going to line the pond. So the pond needs a final bit of prep work. We've got to just remove any stones and lumps and bumps. It's a concrete and stuff when I was laying the blocks. Then we can get the fleece in, the pond liner in, some water in and finally, it's been a long time coming, the pond is going to start to come together. Once we've done that, we can then focus on getting a lot of that earth from the excavating, from the land drainage, put back into the trench. That was all completed yesterday, and within a couple of minutes of connecting up the pipework, water was flowing out down to the bottom pond, so that's lovely to see. And it's nice that we can finally switch off the electric sump pump and rely on gravity, which is free, to take away all the problem water. Well, I have to say, this is making a nice change from some of the hard graft we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. It's a little bit slow and laborious, but this is a very, very important aspect of building a pond. It's all about the prep work, all about the unseen work. And the only way you're going to find the really obvious sharp objects, rocks and stones and bits of glass and, and rubbish and roots is to just go over the ground and just feel it with your hands. You've got to smooth over the ground. So as we're removing a lot of these stones and pulling out some of the objects from the sides, it leaves little holes and caves that need to be filled. Now you can use a mixture of kind of damp, soft sand or builder's sand, or even a little bit of sharp sand if it's not too gritty. Here, a lot of the stuff we've been digging has been this very kind of sandy clay. It's nice and damp, it's perfect for doing this. And it'll take a little while to dry out before it would start to crumble and fall, by which point the pond liner will be in and pressed up against it and holding it in place. It always takes a lot longer than you expect doing this kind of final prep work though, which is a little bit frustrating because it'll be nice to get the pond liner in 
and start filling up all those trenches again with soil. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of my viewers, all of my established subscribers and all of my new subscribers. Again, it always amazes me how much people are watching this and how kind of far and wide these videos are traveling. YouTube algorithm seems to have slowly, slowly started to recommend a lot of these videos. So the view total is going up nicely and the subscriber count is going up daily quite nicely as well. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. I think at some stage, I'm nearing now about five and a half thousand subscribers. Certainly once I hit 10,000 subs, which I never thought was a number I'd be able to achieve, I'd like to start doing some more regular videos and doing some kind of Q&A, possibly even some live videos. So at some stage, I'm going to ask um, you guys, my subscribers, if you want to start emailing me or messaging me various questions that you might have about ponds uh, and I will compile a list of some of my favourite questions and then start to answer them in a video. And there we go. This excavation is finally ready to line. So fleece down, pond liner in had a bite to eat, so we just left the pond liner over the top of the excavation like this, just to let it get a little bit of sun, which is really gonna help to make it sort of stretch and, and be a little bit more pliable. In fact, you've got to be very careful uh, with the liner in the sunshine like this, because it gets very hot. A pair of gloves, you don't really want to be going barefoot on something like this either. And when you're moving and tugging the pond liner, Again, be very careful. If it were to catch and snag on something when it gets very, very hot, that hole is just gonna suddenly run and before you know it, you'll have an enormous tear. So you need to treat the liner with respect. So the first thing we're gonna do is to make sure that we've pulled the liner out. So it's not quite touching the base of the pond and it's been pulled out so that we've got kind of an even um, overlap all around the edges. And then we're gonna introduce a little bit of water into the pond just to hold the pond liner down before we can then start to manipulate and pleat to get all these neat corners. Um, it's flipping out, I have to say. <laughs> I'm not, not looking forward to putting my waders on, but there we go. So we're filling the pond in stages. The important bit was to get some weight in the base of the pond so that we can now start to form all of the neat folds. And in a square or a rectangular pond like this, if you're careful, you should get away with simply four main creases in each of the corners. And what you'll end up trying to achieve is a bit of a gather like this. Oh, I've just found me leaking my waders again. Which with the weight of the water on, is gonna hold that down nicely. And the rest of the pond is gonna be relatively crease free. Simple. <laughs> Right, it's a Friday, it's a beautiful sunny day, it's the start of a bank holiday weekend. I think we've worked hard enough today. It's 20 to 5, so we're going to pack up and call it a day. But it's nice to see a pond at last. It's just taken a little bit longer than I was hoping for to get to this stage, but it's lovely to see, and now we can focus on getting it built. Dave, you've been a trooper all day today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Most of the trenches are all filled again. We've got that last little bit down the end there to finish gravelling and filling. That's where the overflow for the pond is going to run as well, so that's why that's been left open. But all good. And I think this is an appropriate point to finish part one. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you later.